Welcome everyone to the session on brain tumors and focused ultrasound. We have an exciting session for you here with some emerging experts in the field. We're going to dis discuss some advancements in the use of focused ultrasound for enhancing the diagnostics of brain tumors as well as the treatment of brain tumors. So this is a live Q&A session and we're looking forward to getting your questions via the chat function as well as we have some other prepared questions for you. So we'd like to start the session here with some questions. Does anyone want to begin? Thank you, uh, Graham, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll chime in as well. Thank you everybody for joining. I do have a question to start um, and thank you to all the um, speakers uh, and presenters for their outstanding talks. Uh, I hope everybody's had a chance to, to review them. This is a question for uh, Cheng Chao, who I think uh, may be here. Uh, or somebody from from their group. Hi there. So um, I specifically, I mean, focus ultrasound. One of the putative advantages of, of ultrasound has to do with you know accessing parts of the brain that we can't really access safely potentially, and, and certainly pontine gliomas in children are, is one of those areas that there's tremendous promise for that. So I congratulate you for for the work that you've done. I was wondering if you can comment on whether in the course of the, the, the studies that you did, whether you identified any aberrations in brainstem function uh, once you delivered uh, uh, therapy or radiation therapy and also you know, the, the BBB opening and whether uh, you saw any sort of histologic markers of damage or, and, and whether you saw any potentially functional um, issues with regards to respiration, cardiac rate, or any other key brainstem function. Thanks for the question. No, that's the exact reason why we did the study. We were worried about uh, the brainstem, given that many of the main nucleus for uh, survival as well as motor function were there. So uh, what we did was we monitored respiratory rate as well as uh, heart rate during BBB opening. We actually did it in uh, repeat because the way we imagined this uh, technology to be used is in combination with drug delivery, and it's not a one-time incident. And uh, during both openings, we did not find any sort of respiratory changes as well as heart rate changes through the process. But there isn't a good way to monitor um, the ability to swallow. So what we used is we used, we used the, uh, the weights of the mice as a surrogate for ability to eat and swallow. And there was no significant changes compared between the untreated group and the treated group. Lastly, for histological changes, uh, in general, these tumors had have micro hemorrhages, you know, have some, it's, it's an infiltrative disease. So the best way we devised in terms of the assay was that we had two neuropathologists blinded in terms of the histological samples. They didn't know which mice was treated or which one wasn't. And the long story short, they were not able to tell the difference between the treatment group versus the untreatment group. So all in all, from a gross histological standpoint, pathological standpoint, there wasn't significant damage from a functional standpoint, we didn't notice any sort of damage. And the next question is, you know, how does how well is this tolerated with chemotherapy? And we're working on that right now. Great job, great work. Okay. It looks like we have a question here near um, in the chat. I'll I'll read the next one. So this is for Dr. Dr. Park. Can you clarify? Uh, did you perform the focused ultrasound blood-brain barrier disruption followed by five days of temozolomide? And if so, how long was the uh, blood-brain barrier disrupted? Uh, we, uh, we do the BBB opening at the first or second day of temozolomide uh, cycle, during six cycle. Uh, we do the BBB opening for one day, second, first or second day of GMT cycle. Uh, yeah. Great, okay. thank you. Uh, there's a question here also in the chat for Hong Jian Wei. Um, the question is, um, with drug delivery, uh, so the, the question is, is the reason you are sonicating multiple uh, points to treat the areas of the brain that do not show enhancement in T1? And if so, how does drug delivery within the tumor compare to the peritumor space in the surgical resection before ultrasound effect? Is? Yeah, so um, our model is kind of trying to mimic the um, clinical setting that before, uh, after the surgical uh, resection. And I think the, uh, now is a limiting factor of the GBN treatment is not really the destructive tumor mass itself is the surrounding tissue with the microscopic spread where the BBB is relatively intact. So 
in our goal, uh, we're trying to give the uh, treatment as early as possible when the tumor is only have a small cavity. And from the histology, we also find that around this small cavity, this also had the infiltrated area of the tumor cell. So that's our goal. And this area cannot be seen by the T1 because the BBB at this area is relatively intact. So uh, in the clinical setting, I think the GBN treatment, the, the standard treatment for GBN is still the surgical remove the uh, tumor mass itself and then followed by the chemo uh, radiation treatment. So that's our goal. And compared to the uh, tumor itself and the surrounding area, uh, actually, if the tumor mass, the BBB is already disrupted, the drug can easily go into the brain and there's no need for like the FOS or uh, other device to enhance the delivery across the BBB. So uh, I would say we're trying to enhance the drug uh, concentration uh, by uh, focus ultrasound is the goal to enhance in the surrounding area where the BBB is not destructive. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'll extend a question to Dr. Lin related to your work with the cerebral oxygenation and blood-brain barrier disruption and radiotherapy. Question is, is at what time do you think um, would be the best pairing for focused ultrasound blood-brain barrier disruption and radiation? Is there a therapeutic window for this combination? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, is my question? Yes. Oh, uh, the time span between our micro bubble and fast treatment and the radiotherapy is more, no more than two hours. Uh, based on several other articles uh, already published before, uh, the the shortest time span between these two treatment is uh, will be benefit to for the BBB opening uh, to sensitize the brain tumor for the following radiotherapy. Great, thank you. Very interesting work. Um, I have a question for um, for Shelly, Dr. Wang, uh, and the uh, hi Shelly, uh, and the uh, pediatric neurosurgery group in Miami, and specifically related to, um, can you um, just fill us in a little bit about the technical parameters that you used uh, for the ablative um, procedure for the hematomas and the hypothalamus, and also um, any did you encounter any challenges in doing so? Any trouble with heating? Any any technical pearls that you can uh, sort of impart upon us uh, as the field moves towards uh, ablative uh, interventions and in new areas? Thank you so much for the question, Dr. Lipsman. Um, so as you can see from our series, we have a total of five patients for the more hypothalamic hematomas. We had no specific challenges with these HH patients. It was the patient who had the SAGA, um, and I didn't have a chance to actually show his imaging prior on my actual slides. Um, but the child had um, calcifications within the SAGA, and that produced um, uh, challenges intra during the procedure and we understood that there was issues with under treatment um, during the procedure. Um, for that child, he didn't actually present with seizures. He presented with um, uh, a SAGA, um, not even hydrocephalus, but his main goal was for tumor um, uh, control so that he could come off of everolimus. And fortunately for this child at one year um, after the procedure, there was actually an increase in tumor size. So that was really the one patient that we had um, trouble during the procedure um, on just because of the calcifications um, that we encountered and the challenges we encountered periprocedurally with our hypothermic hematomas. No. All of our patients, even the three that we had treated who had had previous procedures done, whether it was lit or surgical resection, did not have any periprocedural challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you. And very interesting work. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll extend the next question to, to Chris um, pa Pacia. Pacia, sorry, I get your name wrong. 
Um, so the, your work related to liquid biopsy is very interesting. Um, the question we have is, can you just describe um, the, uh, sorry, here, where's my, there it is. Uh, what, what are the earliest and latest time points that you see focused ultrasound related tumor biomarkers in your studies? So the earliest time point that we started collecting the blood was about 10 minutes. Um, and that was because we were doing the fuss and then scanning for MRI to verify the BVV disruption. So 10 minutes was the earliest that we could get the blood sample. And then the latest that we've um, acquired the blood sample is about 60 minutes. And we do see that the biomarker concentration seems to peak at around 10 minutes, perhaps even earlier. Um, but that has to do with a lot of the biomarker, um, the short half-life in the blood circulation. So that is one thing we have to consider if um, moving this treatment forward. And the latest time point that you see it, anything related to the tumor? So the latest time point um, is uh, 60 minutes was the last week collected, but I think there is a sharp drop, short, um, sharp drop off um, between 10 and 30 minutes mm. that we have to still investigate. Interesting, thank you. There's a question from the chat uh, for specifically for the Brigham group, a technical question, um, and it has to do with the mouse model that you use. So you briefly mentioned you're investigating the, the 005 mouse model. And if you can comment on the benefits of using this model compared to GL261 models. So I'm not sure if this is something that you can answer or want to answer. So somebody from the... <laughs> uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, I can't answer this question. So um, we found a paper earlier this year, actually during the COVID, um, published in Nature Communications, I honestly forgot the first author's name, but uh, to comparing GL261 and 005, um, they did a lot of phenotyping, uh, all kinds of sequencing, and show that actually 005 is closer to human patient GBM, the immune profile, compared to GL261. Basically, GL261 has a uh, more T cells and less uh, APCs, um, so which possibly can suggest why, generally speaking, more and more people can find that GL261 can respond to uh, um, like checkpoint inhibitors like um, anti PD1 better. Uh, that is why we propose to do GL005 uh, later. As a, as a follow-up question to your work, do you see there being an optimal timing for checkpoint inhibitor therapy with focused ultrasound, given it may not be the case that the checkpoint inhibitor needs to even get into the tumor microenvironment? It may be more related to the cervical lymph nodes or the surrounding lymphoid structures. Do you have a thought on the timing of focused ultrasound with regard to checkpoint inhibitor therapy and whether it's really a drug delivery challenge versus an immunomodulation challenge? I think that's a brilliant question. So <laughs> we actually are trying to do to to change the this scheduling of focus ultrasound to answer this question now. So um, this result has been shown in the presentation, but I um, moved the focus ultrasound schedule three days earlier. Uh, the result is that I see. Uh, more responders, long-term responders, but the overall survival curves won't change. So I think, personally, I think, um, yes, it matters, uh, but it, and also it depends on when the BBB can be, the cell trafficking can be improved, depends on the tumor stage, that do matter but it still needs a lot of work to prove. Great, thank you, thank you. I have a, a follow a last question for Dr. Peng that I, that I prepared for you just because very interesting work related to your nano emulsions. Can you describe the differential characteristics between the, the phase shift nano emulsions and the commonly used microbubble formulations and, and why they may be a differentiator for focused ultrasound? Yeah, totally. So to me, um, nano emulsion is kind of a precursor of microbubble. So it has uh, similar uh, shell contents, essentially the 
makes up the composition. And the copper inside is also perfluorocarbon, but for nano emulsion, the perfluorocarbon has a shorter chain, meaning that it's more um, you know, volatile. So that means if you compress the, uh, the lipid shell combined with this uh, uh, volatile uh, perfluorocarbon core, you can actually convert it into nano emulsion. So that means it's really easy to be vaporized into micro bubble. So I think uh, the benefit of using that one versus the micro bubble directly is that it's kind of an on-demand activation. So just imagine you act, uh, if you activate uh, this droplets inside uh, the pressure field, then you only get activated at the highest pressure point. So that means you really, really localize the damage, whatever bio effect you want to generate in a really localized manner. So I think for brain application, it's really useful because a lot of time, if you try to sonicate the brain, you get uh, you know, really strongly, then you get uh, prefocal damage. And our lab actually have shown that you get prefocal damage in the skull and also along the beam pads previously using mass, mice, rat, and also, uh, you know, I think sometimes happening in humans. So I think using this droplet will really localize the damage. And I think this is the biggest differentiator. And aside from it, I think another point I'd like to add is like uh, using this droplet because it's so localized, you can use really high pressure to activate it, meaning that the damage you generate is pretty strong. So potentially you can directly liquefy the tumor versus for micro bubble, you only generate uh, vessel damage really mildly. So for our study, as you can see in my kind of presentation, the micro bubble only that, sorry, uh, the micro bubble only damaged the blood vessel surrounding the tumors while droplets actually kill the whole tumor volume by liquefying all the remaining tumors. So I think that is uh, that itself is also valuable for, uh, for this kind of uh, platform. So I think this is two point I want to uh, put in here. Thank you. Yeah, great work. Very cool. Um, a question for Dr. Park from uh, the Yonsai group. Um, so uh, you mentioned in the abstract um, that uh, one of the patients underwent surgery. Can you comment on what you found the pathology to be and if you had any sort of uh, surprises in the pathology or whether it was consistent with glioblastoma? And the other question is, um, as you noted in your abstract, we know that temozolomide uh, does cross or can potentially cross the BBB. But what role do you see um, for focused ultrasound in uh, the treatment of patients with glioblastoma and in maintenance uh, chemotherapy? What do you think should be next steps for, for the field? Okay, so Dr. Park may not be, may not be there. Okay. So, okay. Oh, okay. There you are. There you are. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah, there you are. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, patient. You just have a couple minutes to go. So if you can keep your answer brief, that would be great. Uh, okay. uh, patient had a surgery at the other hospital and the pathology report said that uh, there just uh, that there was a tumor cell. Just okay. that report. So... Um, yeah, yes. Uh, and uh, another question uh, was, uh, what did you ask? What role, what, uh, what what are next steps for the field in terms oh, of? Yes, uh, temozolomide can uh, partially across the BBB. So uh, next step will be the using a combination of a chemotherapy agent that have not been tried before because of uh cannot pass through the BBB, uh, that the study will expect it to bring better result to us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we only have about one minute left. Um, maybe we could just quickly go around our virtual room here and everybody just say one quick word about what you think is the most exciting uh, future direction for focused ultrasound. Well, um, Dr. Pang, do you want to kick us off with a short yeah, so I think immunotherapy is definitely something that I'm looking, really looking forward to, and our lab actually has strong emphasis on it. So I think that's something that is really exciting to me. Okay. Great immunotherapy. Well, one vote for immunotherapy. Fred Wu? You're muted there, Fred. In the setting of diffuse midline gliomas, there's zero effective systemic therapy. So 
the ability to get even one would change the field dramatically. Uh, we have a trial that is uh, approved by the FDA, so we're hopefully opening that soon. Great, thank you. It looks like we're going to lose um, the time. Sorry, we didn't get to go around the entire room for everybody, but thanks, everybody. Thank you, Nir, and it was uh, great to, to, to learn from all of you today. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.